Right. So this is Dora. I didn't know how to pronounce her surname, so I thought I'd just check. But it's Dora Militari. So um, a nice round of applause to Dora, and she's going to uh, and she's going to ask the question of where are the women. Dora, one second. Are you on mute? Right, because people on the live stream are saying that they can't hear you. No, it's on the on the main unit. Right. <laughs> right, try again. Can you hear me? Yeah, that's better. Right, there we go. Okay, so my 2017 ended up being a good year because I was hired by the FT and I get to work with very smart people who are also kind. Some of them are in the room and I'm really grateful for that. Um, and I get to work on WebPerf and I am challenged every day. So, whew. Um, and I also feel like the Financial Times really care about diversity. Um, so globally, it's almost like an even gender split. Um, there's actually more women. Um, and at board level, representation of women is 36%. Now, that is higher than the UK government's voluntary target of 33% by 2020. And the FT are committed to increasing diversity um, in the senior management team. So we have the first milestone of reaching gender parity by 2020. Now, I haven't actually got my glasses, so I can't see if there are any raised eyebrows in the room. Uh, because people tend to feel strongly about quotas, and I know I do. Um, and I've read and heard many stories along the line of I was hired because I'm a woman or token person of another sort, and I don't want anyone to feel like that about the FT ever. And I certainly don't want to uh, be someone's box ticking exercise uh, because people aren't numbers. So Besides, you can't always trust quotas to reflect diversity. For those who don't know, this is one of my favorite TV shows called Mad Men. Um, it's about an ad agency in the late 50s, and they're called Sterling Cooper. Sterling Cooper on paper is a picture of perfect gender parity quotas done well, because all these guys have a secretary. <laughs> Nonetheless, there's a strong argument in favor of quotas, and um, Laurie Penny does it um, in the New Statesman. She says that quotas may be the only way of achieving eventually a world where they are obsolete. It's a bit like democracy. I really love this quote. Okay, so beyond all this talk, you're all good people here. And if you're listening to me, that means you have an opinion about diversity one way or another. But one thing we can all agree on is that it's not just about gender parity. That's a pretty binary way of looking at it. It's also about people from all walks of lives, people of all, from all cultures and races, building shoulders in management meetings and things like hearing more than two accents when you walk around the office. Um, and it's also about social class distribution. And at, at a systemic level, diversity is a little bit like um, representation. 
diversity means that more people are represented. That in turn means equality. And equality can mean the end of discrimination and the end of bias, and that surely is a good thing. So um, it's also increasingly clear that diversity makes good business sense, because if you Google why is diversity good in tech, which I have done, the first 10 results are all along the line of because it's good for business. There are studies from the likes of BCG and McKinsey drawing clear links between um, ethnically and gender diverse companies and revenue, especially with innovation revenue. So I think it was McKinsey that said that companies who are ethnically diverse are more than 35% likely to outperform others, um, which is a huge number. So I don't know, for me, that's not a very convincing argument. And I couldn't have worded it better than couldn't have worded it better than Alice Bartlett, who is one of our principal engineers. Um, she says, as someone outside of your company, I don't give a flying fuck if it needs more people, me or people like me to do better itself. Um, and yeah, of course, there is the moral argument you can make for diversity, um, because under all these cut and dry statistics, there are social justice issues like equal access to education and equal access to employment. Um, and there are um, stereotypes around race and, and wealth and social class. Um, and when I say that I value diversity, what I'm really trying to say is that okay, I value social equity and equality of access. And those are the, the key factor of those are the key thing by which you recognize those is diversity. Um, there's a trouble with preaching morality, though. It tends to just sound like lip service. So what and what's a girl to do? How do you measure diversity? How do you quantify it without talking about numbers? How do you make a qualitative assessment of diversity without employing your personal moral values? Um, let's focus on what I think is the most important thing that you can take away from a diverse workplace. I think that's diversity of thought and diversity of experience. You can't really measure that how can you how can you wrap your head around that a uh, basic aspect of network theory there's a man um, he is professor of organizations at carnegie mellon university called david crackard he became famous in the 90s for pioneering um i have to read this sorry cognitive social structures um and he studied the way that how the way that people are connected with an organization correlates with economic performance indicators such as revenue, staff turnover, attrition, things like that. Um, and he did so by analyzing how networks vary in stratification and makeup and density and distribution. And by networks, I mean things like leadership networks, or trust networks in the workplace, or social networks even. Um, and more recently, he's thrown diversity into the mix, and this is where things got interesting. So the study I'm going to quote is, um, I think it was published this year on Harvard Business Review, and it involves an organization comparable in size to the FT. Um, the premise was really simple. Uh, Crackheart went and asked every employee a set of questions to which the answer could only be another employee's name. Questions like, um, with, one day of training, with one day of training, whose job would you step into? Uh, whom would you recruit to support a proposal of yours that might be controversial? Who do you trust to confide uh, in at work about work-related issues? And he then collated this data into a directed graph, like a network diagram. And he colored the nodes differently for men and women. And his analysis found that men were 5.6 times more likely to have ties with other men. Um, now, if there are far more men than women, that means that women have far fewer connections to anyone in the organizations. Okay, so what? Um, if you dig into the data at a team level, the problem becomes very apparent. So just imagine that this is your board of directors. Um, majority are men, there are a few women. That's a pretty familiar situation. Now, if two of the women don't have ties to anybody else within that team, that means that their contribution to the decision-making progress is practically negligible. 
Um, and that means that your leadership team isn't benefiting from the experience or from the expertise or from the perspectives of these women they so struggle to hire. So let's zoom out again. Um, in the decision-making network in this company, there were 14% more ties between members of the same gender than um, Packard would have expected if we weren't taken gender into consideration. And maybe, you know, maybe less surprisingly, the emotional support network has 27% more same gender ties. In the middle, the idea sharing or innovation network had 22% more same gender ties. Now, if you squint and look at the code distribution on that graph, you'll see that women are in clusters and they're completely absent from some areas of the business and they have fewer incoming ties. So what does that mean? That means fewer people are coming to them, uh, seeking them out to discuss new ideas. Um, and for me, these graphs are both like worrying and like, bah, and also holy eureka moment, Batman, because I just realized something. Um, you as a company can hire your way out of any diversity cluster you want, but it won't work unless you realize one thing which is that diversity is just as much about composition as it is about interaction. So role people, why is that last part so difficult? Because people be people and there are group psychology, aspects of group psychology at play. What do I mean? First of all, subtle biases, they're persistent. We tend to associate with people who are like us subconsciously sometimes. And that can often lead to exclusion or self-exclusion. So I read about this study um, where I think they were asking employees who were of different race to their supervisor um, to report about any perceived differential treatment. And they were reporting on differential treatment like discrimination or a lesser quality of relationship far more than we had expected and, and you know, far above other groups. And then minority group members tend to conform. So um, female investment bankers, of which there are a few in my former group of university colleagues, um, tend to adopt masculine behavior so that they are perceived as successful by their peers. It's a bit like being more dog. Except the pack, the majority group, put up resistance because they feel automatically left out of any diversity initiatives and they see diversity initiatives as um, favoritism. So yeah, this is all a bit weird and somewhat <laughs> discouraging. Got a prop, got a prop. I didn't, you can't see it there, but this is a sheet of Pantone 488C. It's what, <laughs> it's what they put on cigarettes to put you off. Um, and what I want you to take away um, from this is that if you say we value diversity, that should mean more than we recognize we will be more successful if we are less homogenous. So don't be pantone. So where, did that, where does that leave you and what can you do? You can check your biases. We're all biased. Um, hire people, people. Put together a good crew, trust in them. That is, I just noticed that alien is smoking something. It's a cigarette. <laughs> reach out, reach out. If you don't know where to start with women in tech, try Twitter because there are so many of us there. Um, support and nurture your people, recognize them. Be a feminist because we need you. Leave no one behind, no matter their gender, ability, race, or class. And um, speak up, because silence serves nobody. I don't care if you're uncomfortable. It's OK to be awkward. I'm awkward. No one minds. Um, being a true self is really important. Um, but don't say stuff like that. I fit all your photos, because that's just annoying. And take responsibility for your words especially as you progress in your career and you become more senior, you become stronger because people will listen. Listen to people. Get out of your comfort zone. 
make new connections. Celebrate diversity because tolerating difference is not the same as embracing it. Thank you. Here's a slide you can tweet. Woo!